Max Sklar. He's a Yale alum, class of 2006, Sullivan College. And he's going to be talking about career after Yale and what he's learned since then. He currently works uh, at Foursquare as a machine learning engineer. Yeah, we're looking forward to a good talk. All right, so thank you everyone for coming today. It's uh, really great to be back at Yale after graduating 12 years ago. I've been on campus a lot, but this is the first time I got to actually go back and eat at my Silliman Dining Hall and actually come back and like give a presentation here and talk to undergrads. So I'm really excited about that. When I thought about today's event, uh, there were so many things from the last 12 years that I could have spoken about and I have kind of in my mind and also like on my Google Drive, I have all these docs with so many different tech talks and so many different versions of like workplace skills and things like that. There's one I like to do on workplace communication, which maybe I should make a video on that one day. It's pretty good, but you can see some of it online. Uh, but uh, today I just want to step back and tell you a little bit about my journey since I graduated from Yale and how it formed my current approach to what I'm working on and what projects that pick me up in the future. And so I hope that this will be helpful to you in as you think about the next few years of your own life and, uh, and your own career. So let's go back to 2006 uh, when I was at school here at Yale. I actually remember a time when you couldn't go back and you couldn't go up and pull up a detailed map of the entire world on demand. That had been radically changing the last few years. You know, in the 1990s, we had MapQuest, and we had a very detailed map of the whole world. It was kind of a pain to bring up. I don't know, it's, it's almost mind-boggling to think of this. If you wanted to move the map to the right, you had to press the right button, and then it would all reload again, and it would take 60 seconds, and your map would be over to the right a little bit more. And then from that point in like mid-90s, something like that, all the way to 2006, all these cool things started coming out. You had like Keyhole, and uh, that was bought by Google and became Google Earth, and you had Google Maps, and, um, and all this stuff. That summer, in the summer of 2005, and that was just before my final year at Yale, Google Maps launched their API so that you can actually build on top of their service and put stuff on the map. So I thought it'd be really fun to have people post little icons all over the map and like leave messages. It'd be really cool because I could go on and like you know write something over here in this neighborhood, and then someone else can go on and see what I wrote. You know, we don't call them icons these days. Now we would call them either stickers or emojis, but that's what they were. And so here it was. It was kind of like you know, the, in the wording of the time, the lingo of the time, would kind of be like the uh, the Wikipedia of maps, and maybe in practice it was less like Wikipedia and maybe more like a giant graffiti wall of maps, but it was kind of cool because I saw a lot of people go on it. There were a lot of, you know, what I call real people using it. It's not that like my friends and family aren't real people, but when you see someone you don't know using it, then you're like, oh my god, there's a real person in the wild using it. It was very exciting. And it was actually useful. I started finding it really useful to find new places in New Haven um, to kind of explore, and then if I ever left and went to a new city, it was kind of fun to see uh, what other people wrote on. Now I did have one problem that it was kind of tough to find some time to spend on it. So I had a brilliant idea to get more time to spend on it, and that was to turn it into my senior project. So I did that. And then my second semester and my senior year, I had tons and tons of time to work on. So here's what it looked like after a year of developing it. I still have nightmares about like, you know, yeah. JavaScript and IE6 at the time, so I didn't go into front end engineering. Yeah. I hear it's much better now, but uh, Oh my god, I was so excited when they killed it. Microsoft killed IE6. That was kind of my side project um, and my Yale project. But uh, the interesting thing about this is that the idea sort of, I didn't really know what to do with the idea after I graduated, but I saw the same themes coming up again and again. And in 2009, I actually worked for a company called Yodel, which was a search engine marketing company. They hired me to build their local search engine. So that's great, I can get paid to do this stuff. But ultimately, the issue was Yoda wasn't a consumer company. And you know, it was they were just trying to drive leads to their clients. And so I actually wanted to make a search engine that was really, really good, that didn't really align with the goals of the company. So eventually the product was shut down after I left, and it wasn't really um, what I wanted to be working with. So then next I did what everyone else does in their mid-20s when they don't know what to do next. I went to business school. But Sort of. It was actually a master's in computer science. Uh, it had some 
technology related, you know, business courses in it. And, you know, I already learned a ton of computer science right here. So to me, it didn't make sense to have a full, you know, 100% of the courses being computer science. And I got to, I got to go to NYU Stern for a little bit as well. So in 2010, I was doing a course called online community, I think electronic communities. And basically we had to go to these local businesses in New York and figure out how they can get their word out online. Um, I was actually assigned this women's beauty salon in Nolita. They did this like nail polish art. So I didn't know anything about that, but <laughs> I sort of tried to tell them, you know, here's, let's try to figure out some way to get your business out online. So, you know, I looked at, uh, looked at Google, I looked at Yelp, and then I came across this brand new app called Foursquare. I finally broke down and got an Android phone. This was like in late 2010. And it's interesting because, you know, right when I graduated, we were right on the cusp of this consumer revolution in mobile. And I was really late in seeing it. I kind of saw it, but um, I worked to change that later on so that I can see these kind of larger trends coming sooner. But uh, I'll talk about that a little more later in the talk. So I got my Android phone and I downloaded Foursquare. And I found that it was a really fun game where you can actually interact with the places while you're there. So it's like revolutionary. You know, before I kind of had to go back to my desktop and type about what I did that day. It's a little bit of a drag sometimes. So people would check in, they had their activity feed, people would win badges, they would fight each other for the mayorships. Uh, in Foursquare, the mayor is the person who was there the most. Sometimes they would win, you know, sometimes they would get free stuff for being the mayor of like a bar or something. So. I kind of recognize, based on the projects that I did before, that um, this is where the technology I was working on needed to go, and it was sort of the connecting piece that uh, that made it all fit together and made it useful. Now, it turns out the people who started Foursquare they didn't come up with this idea from scratch either. They had to go through many attempts as well. And one of the things that you learn uh, when you're building products in the marketplace is that everyone kind of learns from each other. And even though you might not always profit off of it every single time, it's always kind of a source of enjoyment when your ideas get picked up. And you know, it never really ceases to amaze me how often a single comment or one slide or one picture or even one thought uh, can travel and make people change their outlook. So we've been pretty good at this at Foursquare. A lot of stuff that we built have actually made it into other apps. Has anyone here used TimeHop at all? No one's heard of time hop. All right, I wasn't thinking so. It's a pretty cool app that sort of shows you exactly what you were doing on this day, yesterday, two days ago, five days ago. But they were developed in a Foursquare hackathon. All right, how many of you use Instagram? That's like everybody. That started out as uh, a Foursquare-inspired photo app, actually. And I'll get to bots in a minute. And Facebook, well, I think Facebook actually has a room full of people dedicated to copying us. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think I've been in there, actually. When you have good ideas, it's kind of inevitable you have all these imitators. And it's also, on the flip side of that, is that it's important to learn from everybody else. Maybe not copy someone word for word, but learn from others' ideas and other people. So at the same time all this was going on, I was in grad school. I also started to get really interested in machine learning and natural language processing. I did take machine learning here at Yale, took it with uh, uh, Dana Angloen, it's really good, but I tried to get a job in it after, and I didn't really find it. I was at a company right when I graduated called Wireless Generation, which was it was an education startup, and they were kind of leaning towards you know machine learn instruction as their north star, but it was like so far down the roadmap that in practice we didn't really get to work on it as much or at all. At least my team, I didn't get to work on it at all. So I started taking more classes at NYU. I started self-studying you know, get over this idea of machine learning, which is like, you know, writing code is hard, but maybe we can have our computers write this code automatically. And I know in machine learning, usually you're trying to learn weights, but or coefficients, but you know, the coefficients, is, are, they are the code, like the, the code is just information. And so this is what, you know, I think continues to be a, a game changer, and that's how you solve really, really hard problems. And they're open-ended problems. They're not just like, you know, what you do in, in 
algorithm class, which is interesting when you like you you want to take something and transform it through a function. You're trying to learn the function and you're trying to get really close to it. And so it's just a really interesting, different sort of open-ended problem. So it turned out that this is exactly what Foursquare wanted to do with its location data. And I got to be a big part of building the recommendation engine from the ground up. Now, the person I reached out to at Foursquare, he was uh, the co-founder, uh, a really interesting guy, and his name was Dennis Crowley. He's, uh, he's a very relatable person. It's not the stereotypical Silicon Valley guy. This is New York City, after all. Oh, yeah, this may be a mythical quote, so I don't want to have him watch this and say I never said this, so I have to do this. But I think that there was one time when he was being interviewed and someone asked him, like, you know, why would you have your tech company in New York rather than San Francisco? And he said something like, you know, because I live here, you know, rather than, you know, diving into, like, oh, the New York tech scene and all that. But anyway, you can kind of see what he's like on my podcast, which I'll get to in a little bit. I sat down and interviewed him in episode seven. And he goes around and talks to entrepreneurs and creators and engineers all the time. And this is the kind of stuff that he says. He says, don't let people tell you that your ideas can't work. Don't listen to the haters. There's always haters. Don't listen to the people who want to shoot down your ideas. If you're passionate about something, if you have an idea that no one's done yet, teach yourself that those ideas don't work and then iterate on top of them. But don't let other people push you around in that way. And I think that's a very powerful message. And it's coming from him, it's really, Nice, because I think he, he lives it. He doesn't, just, he doesn't just say it. So one of the things that uh, I like to say about this is sometimes you can't follow it right away. You know, life happens. It is a challenge sometimes to get the time or you know, the, the buy-in to, um, to work on a particular idea that you have. But uh, it's something that you can always work towards. And so if, for those of you out there who have this nagging feeling that you need to build something, or if you get that nagging feeling sometime in the future, I think this is a quote to go back to and to remember. This is a real quote because there's an actual video on YouTube, but he says some version of this a lot. So let's talk about some of the things I built at Foursquare. When you go to Foursquare, uh, each venue has a rating from one to 10. And where does that come from? Well, we designed an algorithm and you know I've been building that sort of from its inception to the latest iteration. And I get a lot of positive feedback on these ratings. Like sometimes people who don't know me, they don't know what they're, they, they'll do. I'll ask them about Foursquare and they'll be like, oh yeah, I don't go to any place that is ranked less than a 9.0. And they'll be like, I don't think it's that exact, but uh, I really appreciate it. I, we've gotten really positive sort of reviews in the industry on this. Um, sometimes finding the best places and the worst places are kind of funny. I, people like to hear about the worst places, like this is one of the worst, in the, this is, I think, the worst in New York. It's one of the post offices. I think the worst place in the world at one point when we looked was Pat, the office where you have to get your passport in Moscow. It's like a long line. It's the worst place. Or at least it's the worst place where you have internet. I'm sure there are much worse places. OK, so how did we build this? If you may have used Yelp, you probably noticed that uh, they kind of average out people's star ratings. And then everything kind of tends to be at 3.5 stars. And it tends to be dominated by people who are angry because they had a fly in their soup. And then they write five pages about it. We took a more engineering approach. We uh, looked at a mixture of natural language processing and machine learning on the four square tips, which are, which are these little things. You know, uh, there are a few sentences, very short reviews, or very short tips sometimes that people write. And this is one of our admin pages. Every time you write a tip on Foursquare, you download the app and go to the website, that tip is tagged with a sentiment. This sentiment is based on the words and even entire phrases that you use. So there's a lot of components, there's lots of stuff going on here because the first thing that happens is there's a language detection component based on character engrams and a dictionary and also just looking at the character sets. It's harder than you might think to detect what language something is. Then there's word tokenization, kind of breaking the words apart, which is not so hard in English, but it gets pretty hard in German and like really hard in Chinese. And then there's an elastic net logistic regression component on top that sort of picks out the words, or attempts to pick out the words that have real meaning in terms of sentiment. So this one here, best ever, that's gonna have a positive sentiment. But hopefully this one here, chicken noodle soup, well, that shouldn't affect sentiment. You know, maybe most people like chicken noodle soup, but it, it doesn't matter the fact that they're mentioning chicken noodle soup, it's just whether they're saying it's great or whether they're saying it's not so great. So there's kind of a logistic regression on top that takes all of these 
features. Uh, it's a very common thing in machine learning, no matter what you're doing, whether it's deep learning or whatever. There's always a logistic regression on the top layer. And uh, this particular one is a custom one that I built in Python on my GitHub account, which you can get. But I needed some features that, at the time, the standard tools didn't have, uh, particularly for multi-class logistic regression. This is multi-class. This is you know, positive, negatives, and mes. And that's something that I would recommend. If you want to do machine learning, yeah, implementing your own logistic regression is probably a really good exercise, because it's not something that's like overly hard. But you'll learn about kind of where the snags are, and you'll kind of figure out you know, you know, how it all goes. So in practice, it actually picks out some really interesting things. One example that we give sometimes is it can actually tell the difference between someone saying, this place is the shit, and just, this place is shit. And it's just that one word, it can figure out what the difference is. Uh, and it also works in a lot of different languages, because we have our own labeled training data. So they so actually give us explicit ratings, so they say they like a place, they say they dislike a place. That's not enough to actually get the rating, but what it is, it's enough to look at the people who gave us a thumbs up or thumbs down, and then, then we have a training, a training example on a tip, and then we get hundreds of thousands of those automatically. So one of the best things about this is that the reason why I really like this as an example of something that, that I built in machine learning is because it's getting smarter all the time as we collect more data, as more tips are coming in. So, for example, when I first built this, some languages like Czech or Chinese, uh, we didn't have enough training data when we started. But then, as Foursquare grew, the model was retrained weekly, and then it essentially learned more languages and got better. And this is kind of a rare, rare uh, thing when you write code. Usually, when you write code and you walk away, well, the best thing that can happen is that it just works, and then it just continues to work indefinitely. But usually what happens is it needs to be maintained. It starts to annoy people. People say, oh, that's old. Nobody knows how it works anymore. But rarely does it actually get better, you know, as time goes on, which is the really cool thing about this. This is kind of the goal of machine learning. And so it's, it's awesome. Like, I'm living my life. I'm walking down the street. I'm on vacation. And my algorithm is like in Spanish class or something. So it's really unbelievable. So let's talk about another project that I did. Uh, I did a lot of stuff at Foursquare. Here's one of the cool things that I led. This is Marsbot. And again, it's one of those experimental projects. It's one of those concept products that where we kind of put the stake in the ground and we say, this is what we think the future is, and this is a new way of thinking about the problems that we're solving. So the kind of tagline I give is that Marsbot is a character in your pocket that learns your daily habits and routines and uses that to build a profile view and it texts you local recommendations. So let's see a little bit about what it does. Oh, this is Dennis again with his thing. We didn't want to create a chat bot to endlessly answer your questions. We wanted to create a context bot, one that can understand where you're standing and learn from the places you've been and predict what you may want to do next. So here are some examples. This is one that I got, you know, at the bagel store. And then it says, hey, after a meal at the Bagel Delight, some people like to grab a cup of coffee at Hungry Ghost nearby. So it'll sort of tell you what to do next. And sometimes it'll tell you, it'll actually get as specific as, like you'll walk into a place and it'll tell you exactly what to order, which is always, always a lot of fun. All built on the NLP on Foursquare. So this one uh, is interesting because it kind of tells you what it learns as time goes on. So in this thing, it says, hey, looks like you were at Kelly and Ping. I couldn't help but notice. You might have been to National Thai restaurant before. Do you want me to keep looking out for great Thai restaurants? Then you can say yes or no. So rather than it sort of, as most software does these days, it kind of sneaks around and gets insights about you, this one actually tells you what it's learned about you as time goes on. You can go into the app and you can see all the things that it's learned about you. Uh, we gave it kind of a fun personality. Even though it's not primarily a bot that you can text, why not? Uh, programming the ability to text it back. You can do search by emoji, you can do search by phrase. You, if you don't like the result, you could say, show me another result or give me a closer result or that's too expensive. One of the things that I wanted to do with it that I never did was like, you can have, I, I started doing this with like the closer, but like you can have a back and forth with it. Like, I don't like this because it's too close I, or too far. I don't like this because it's too expensive. And then it kind of zeroes in on the results that you might want. So if you say closer, it, it gives you a closer result. And one of the fun things you can't see here, but in, in this result says, my sources tell me it's a cool Mexican restaurant, and over here it says, 
you know, a wonderful Cuban re restaurant nearby, notice it picks the adjective. It actually has an adjective, has it actually has an adjective pick picking engine to describe the place based on the ratings and some, some stuff that's in there. So there's a lot of really smart things in here. So aside from that, another thing that I got to do at Foursquare is that I got to do a little more self-study in machine learning. I did a bunch of research into how to deal with count data and categorical data and that stuff because we just have so much of it, you know, ratings and counts and how much does a certain action happen, that sort of thing. So this led me to look into the Dirichlet distribution and how it works to model this type of data. And I even did a little bit of research and dove deep into the math and came up with a way to get the optimal Dirichlet distribution based on counts really fast. So I will, there's a video on that, that uh, that was kind of a fun thing. And it was fun to build a tool that maybe wasn't a game changing tool, but it was something that, uh, that I can actually use. And, and then here's some more research we kind of do at, at Foursquare, something that we look into. This was looking into convolutional nets uh, with some of my coworkers. Uh, in particular, this is uh, Zen Fan, who's one of my coworkers who was working on this. And also my professor at NYU, uh, Jan LeCun, was kind of the inventor of convolutional nets. He's one of the more well-known people in it. So convolutional nets are used to pick, uh, are, are used primarily to classify images. And we have tons of pictures of food, so we want to do this to see if we can tag our pictures of food because we want people to be able to you know, search for certain things like hot dog and actually get pictures of hot dog back. So this is our hot dog detector. We have tons of detectors, but I feel like everybody has a hot dog detector. Maybe that's the standard. If you check out the picture of the lower, in the lower left, that's not really a hot dog. Uh, if you look very quickly, you can see why it might think it's a hot dog. I believe it's actually chocolate and vanilla pudding, but it, the, the vanilla pudding looks like a bun somehow. It really does. Uh, so I found the one picture of pudding that looks like a hot dog. To sort of head towards the close with all of these uh, different fields in computer science that you can go into, and all these new frameworks and new technologies and different companies, and not to mention like the sea of thoughts and ideas that we all live in, how do we figure out what to build and what to spend our time on? That's how I got into forecasting. Yeah, basically trying to predict the future, or at least trying to imagine different ways that the future can unfold. And it started a few years ago when I invited a few friends to go upstate and basically I just invited them to help me work, with, help me through my work problems for a weekend. And they said, yeah, sure. And one offered his cabin, another offered to make breakfast. And I, it's like they thought they were on vacation, but really they were spending a weekend to try to solve all my problems, which was awesome. Uh, it's one fun thing that you could do with your friends. And one of the most fun things that we did in that retreat, making predictions about technology and about the world in various increments. So you'd be like, make some predictions about two and a half years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And it sort of got, you know, we got to be a little creative. We got to be a little funny. You know, we didn't take it too seriously. We're not betting on this stuff, but um, it sort of makes you think in, in ways that you wouldn't otherwise think. And so I think one big problem is there's a large group of people who are very scared to make predictions because, you know, they're scared about being wrong. In fact, most of the time when you make these kinds of predictions, whether it's the technology, business, that sort of thing, politics, you're probably going to be wrong. Then most of the predictions that you actually do here in your day to day are from people who don't care about that at all and then they'll just make a prediction about anything, no matter how uninformed they may be. So it's sort of like a self-selecting you know, group of people making bad predictions that you hear. Just write down some of the predictions that you hear if you're watching TV, and then wait a few years and see if they come true, like that it won't be, that it'll be worse than throwing dice. So the approach the I, that uh, I like to take is kind of go ahead, make some predictions, think about them, have fun with them, and then review them in a year, two years, and then one of the interesting things that happens is that you kind of learn from your mistakes and you tend to get better and better over time. And uh, the mistakes that you make actually teach you the most about your own misperceptions. So if you're like, something's going to happen in a year, and then a year later you're like, I give it one more year. And then a year later you say, no, I give it another year. Yeah, you're continually wrong, but then you have to think about well, what's happening here. Why am I constantly you know, overestimating something that I, that I think is going to happen? You know, what, and when you dive deeper into that, you kind of have a more interesting discussion. So we started doing this every year, and we hold, started holding it in a different place. Last year, I told my friends, hey, friends, you want to go to Yale? And they said, hell yeah, let's go to Yale. So here they are. Uh, this cross-campus library. 
And now, as I said before, I graduated. I graduated right before the mobile consumer revolution, and I didn't really catch it, catch on to it until pretty late in the game. But I caught on to it eventually. Well, everyone did. And when Dennis came on my podcast a few weeks ago, I asked him about this lull in consumer technology that we've had over the last five years. And I think maybe it's just a perception on our end because you know because of the type of mobile apps that we build. You know, because we kind of see the there's time we went from flip phones to iPhone very quickly, and now the changes seem a lot more incremental, at least in that particular domain. But I think that the world is changing like really fast under the surface. I said that this, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of the time that I was in college or at Yale, like from in the mid 2000s, when we were sort of expecting big changes from say our desktop and laptop computers, and you know internet speeds, and they were improving, but it was like, you know, the, the previous five years, we all went to like dial up and big clunky machines to like slimmer machines with, you know, high speed. So it, it seemed like things were going much more slowly, but in reality, a lot of the services that we, we were using every day, day were just starting up back then. So I'm talking about, you know, Google Maps, as I said, and Gmail and Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. So. I actually think that now we're on the cusp of really big changes again, and you guys are going to be, you know, graduating eventually right into that in the next few years. And, you know, some of it will come from transportation, automated cars and trucks. You'll look for that in your first few years out of school. I think it'll come from, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, all of these uh, crypto networks as they're coming to be called, but I doubt that term is going to stick. But of course, we're still seeing the spread of narrow AI across every domain, that just continues. That's just the gift that keeps on giving. And it's some of these things are getting really, really smart now, now that you know we have AIs that have beat people in Jeopardy and beat people in Go. Very smart systems and then ones that have you know learned to do it in seconds or minutes or something like that. So you know I constantly think of ideas on how to make machine learning algorithms a little bit less narrow, how to make them you know, better than they are today, or, or give, you know, give some of the things that I built the ability to, uh, to succeed in multiple domains. But I realized that I didn't want to go it alone, and I wanted to do it with a community of interested and interesting people. And so that's sort of where this podcast comes in. My podcast is called The Local Maximum, and it launched in early February. It's exactly 14 years since my weekly show on WYBC launched. Does anyone here listen to Yell Radio or, or, or on Yell Radio? Has ever, anyone been in the studio? You've been in the studio. Awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, I love that studio. I had, I had a show there every week. Um, but we were just kind of having fun. I mean, most of the time we were just sort of making fun of the YCC and things like that. But, you know, it's fun now. I kind of listen back. It's actually, it's still funny. Now, like, I know about a lot more things. And so I have, you know, certain things I could teach on my podcast. and. I also find a lot of cool people that I can bring on. As you probably know, the phrase, the local maximum, it's a mathematical term. It refers to a point at which you need to step down in order to reach new heights. But uh, people, and not just points, can get caught in the local maximum. And that means they've gone as far as they can through one strategy, which has sort of gone stale, and they need to search for new ideas. And we also talk about this you know, in product design, and machine learning. We sometimes ask if we're in a local maximum and whether starting from a fresh perspective can lead to better results. So this podcast is about examining technology, engineering, and social trends through the lens of you know, expanding perspectives and moving beyond the local maximum, both for ourselves and for our algorithms. So sometimes I'll interview engineers and entrepreneurs that I admire and I like to pick you know, people who have actually built something valuable and you know, that most people wouldn't have thought about or people with ideas that I want to explore further. And I go over techniques in the world of AI and machine learning that the average person can understand and I show how to get our algorithms to be more flexible uh, through the same process that we use on people. But I could also use my unique experience to examine current events and things like that. So I'm sort of sending around the email list. It's completely optional, you can get off at any time. And I actually haven't sent anything to it yet. I'll probably send something to it, you know, 
somewhat infrequently, but this is going to kind of become part of the group of people interested in bouncing around these ideas and listening to these people on my podcast. So uh, I hope you'll join me, and if you want to sign up uh, by the end of the talk, and if you haven't yet, you know, find the sheet and sign up. So that's my personal pitch, and I'm very passionate about that, but I also have to end with Foursquare's pitch. Uh, so you could actually go to the podcast and listen to the people who work at Foursquare and see what they're like. So that's pretty cool. You know, what other company can do that? I mean, you can go there when you're interviewing, you meet the people, but that's not the real, you know, you don't really get a sense of what they're like by doing that. Uh, this is just an image. This is the exponential growth in our location and intelligence panel. So you have a good exponential growth curve there. We do real machine learning to solve lots of problems. Uh, the problems that we work on tend to be very applicable to many different fields. So for example, right now I'm using, I'm looking into causal modeling and doing a lot of that stuff. And you know, no one in the right mind is gonna say, causal models, who uses that? It's basically, you know, the science of figuring out what causes what or what's working. So yeah, my use cases for ads, and maybe it's not that important for me, you know, that sub Subway sells a few extra sandwiches or you know, Starbucks uh, sells a few extra cups of coffee. I want to get the, the algorithm and the methodology right, and then I think, you know, I can make sure that it's, I can get it applied all over the place. No, no matter where you're, no matter what problem you're working on, no matter what business you're at or whatever, you, you want to figure out, you know, how you can measure cause and effect. So it's foursquare.com slash jobs if you're interested. You can ask me about any questions when it comes to open roles. And check out The Local Maximum on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. And so thanks a lot for having me. And now I open for questions. Yes? What do you think? Uh, so I noticed like on that, on that board you had earlier uh, from when you came to Yale, uh, what are you doing? jobs in like the next five years and what should we be looking for when we graduate? Well, in terms of just, you know, engineering jobs, anything that has to do with, it's the field that I'm in, right? But it's anything that has to do with data pipelines and data analysis and, you know, also machine learning and, and NLP, I'm still very bullish on, have been for many years, and I think that will continue. I think all these engineering jobs will continue. I think. Another trend that will continue, none of, these, none of these are new trends in the next five years, but I think another trend that will continue is, you know, using uh, AI machine learning and these data pipelines to the fields of uh, education and healthcare, always very big. And then of course, you know, blockchain, Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's a lot of, join a small force, uh, small startup there, sort of start looking into that technology. I think, you know, that stuff's gonna be huge in five to ten years and there's I, I mean what's going on there is really exciting uh so if you're interested in that that's um something that uh i would recommend and i think that um that was one more thing i feel like in the past people wanted to get into technology weren't thinking of transportation as an interesting field is becoming a lot more interesting now particularly with you know elon musk and self-driving cars and google waymo and all that i listened to a podcast recently about self-driving trucks and it was like okay, you gotta figure out what these truckers are gonna do in their spare time to drive with it. It's very interesting to think about. I think that there's a case to be made, I, I kind of joke, like the last three episodes of my podcast have been just ranting about Facebook, but I feel like there's a, there's a case to be made that there's something um, sort of broken about the way that we communicate with each other online. Uh, it's gonna be a, a tough one to fix and I know a lot of people who are trying to solve that problem. I think that's an interesting one that will come up in the next few years. Data, sec anything involving security, always going to be really good. So I, I think I gave you enough off the top of my head. I, <laughs> but uh, that's sort of, I think those are those are good places to start. Yeah. yeah you mentioned like your research on like the ratio distribution. Yeah. I feel like in just in general, like how do you feel like in terms of like applications of high level mathematics, and do you see like a, a practical value in pursuing high level math? Yeah, so the question is with regards to the Dirichlet distribution, finding a practical value in high level math. And that's, I always kind of, I, you, you've probably heard a lot of people in your classes, particularly if, you know, before you got to Yale when you were in grade school, you probably heard a lot of people saying, you know, when are we ever going to use this stuff? And I always sort of took the approach. Well, I'm sitting here, I have to be here and learning it, so I might as well figure out a way to use this stuff. I think that a lot of this higher level math is a lot of people just 
do it for the fun of it and for math's sake. But if you look at it very closely, then you will find applications. And the work I did with the Dirichlet distribution is, you know, I can't get into it now that much. I built a tool that we actually use in our systems, and it's not, you know, it, it comes up with priors, which in Bayesian statistics is like, you know, what is, let's say I have a weighted coin, and it's like, uh, before I start flipping this coin, what's my prior on what the weight is? It depends on the problem. And by analyzing similar problems in the past, it comes up with your prior for you. And so sometimes it's just best to like observe the coin, but sometimes if you don't have enough data, it's good to have a prior that can, that can help you through that. And so I think doing that project, I came up with a cool tool that I could use. And also I got a very good intuition for these types of Bayesian problems that even if I wasn't using the tool directly, it kind of helps, you know, when I'm trying to think through real life problems, like real causal models, I'll, I'll kind of think like, oh, well, our prior isn't good, or no, this has nothing to do with the prior, trust me, I know prior, <laughs> something like that. I feel like building intuition is often the, is, is often the biggest uh, game, so. I, that's my thought on it. I don't, does that answer you? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, yes. I guess, yeah, to like contribute to machine learning and stuff, how much of it um, would you need a PhD for? Like, to contribute what, to what, machine learning? What areas is, like, would be off limits to someone who's like, straight out of like, a bachelor's degree and like, wants to contribute to this? So what, is anything off limits to someone just with a bachelor's degree? I really don't think so. I think the, the issue that I had in getting into machine learning was not someone saying, Oh, you don't have the right degree for it. And in fact, you know, my program at NYU, yeah, I did a lot more machine learning there. I self-studied just because I was really interested in that. But anyone could do that. What was kind of preventing me from getting into it was the fact that the companies that I was working at, their business models weren't, were never going to make the kind of machine learning I wanted to do a top priority. So it takes a while. <laughs> you, that's why you have to kind of learn about now, academia could be different. You might want, you might need more more credentials in academia. But if you want to build machine learning models for companies, or if you want to build anything and you want to do it at a company, you actually have to kind of start learning business. And you kind of have to start asking a lot of questions and figuring out, you know, how do they think? What's the company goal and all that? And you can kind of tell whether what you're working on is going to be. You can kind of tell that what if what you want to be working on is ever going to be part of their roadmap. That's what takes a long time. And that's why the first few years out of school are kind of tough in that regard. But uh, now that I told you what the game is, maybe it's less, you know, less stressful. Oh. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I was interested in uh, the, you were talking about problems with very small differences, but very large uh, differences in outcome, like this restaurant is shit versus this restaurant is that shit. Right. Um, another one maybe I noticed with the chatbot was you heard that you would post, like you'd ask it for a Mexican restaurant nearby and I gave you a Cuban one. Mm -hmm. Girlfriend is Mexican and would, that would not. Right, right, right. Cool. I mean, so that Cafe Havana is kind of mixed, so it's a little bit, it's it's tagged as both Cuban and Mexican in our database. I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. But uh, that's actually kind of funny with that place because, so I went to Cuba a couple of months ago and someone said, I was going to Venmo something, someone for someone, someone gave me some like Cuban money. And I, pay, and I Venmoed them back, and someone said, you can't put the Cuba in Venmo because then they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get flagged. And I'm like, I'll just Venmo you. So then I get back home. Trip was great. Everything was fine. I get back home. Someone bought me a sandwich from Cafe Habana, and I Venmoed them back. I said, thanks for the sandwich at Cafe Habana. And then, then all of a sudden, like, you know, it got, this, this has been flagged. This has been, I got in trouble for... Uh, I, it went through eventually. Just a funny story. Though. We have a lot of issues in our database with cultural sensitivities as well. Anywhere in the world where there's like a, where there is sort of a dispute over land between countries, we get like tons of incoming complaints about, oh, you told me I was in this country, but that's not true. And it's... Uh, what do you do in those scenarios? I mean, what you do in those scenarios is that... Uh, you just kind of try to, um, you try the best you can to find heuristics that maybe cut them out. You sort of try to learn, okay, what's going to be the most embarrassing for me? You know, can I get rid of 90% of those cases? It's not really a great solution, but that's sort of the best we have. Yeah, in the back. This is kind of similar to your first question, but 
are there any trends that you specifically see not continuing over the next five years, or things that are sort of coming to their end? Any trends that I see not continuing or coming to their end? That's a really tough one. I think I even said, you know, on my podcast that you know I was going through different technologies, different points in their life cycle, and I was like, these are the ones at the beginning, these are the ones at the middle, the ones at the end. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I was kind of stuck. But now that I'm thinking about it off the top of my head, I think that all of these apps that everyone was coming up with maybe five years ago, five, six, seven years ago, that's since been become just very saturated. You know, building a cool website, even before that, has become very saturated. And that's one of the reasons why people are looking into these chatbots, because they're like, well, you know, we can't get noticed if we just build another app, one of a million, so what are we going to do? And I think that when you, you see that, it doesn't mean that those apps are not going to be there. There's still going to be lots of, it's kind of like, it's so crowded, nobody goes there. But to build something new, and to build like a new business out of that, I think you need something more than just an app. Um, so that's, that's one example. All the technology around it, like the, you know, the Apple ecosystem, and you know, that'll still be there. But you're not going to have a, a hot new startup based off the app kind of course Yes. Yeah. Something that you mentioned earlier, and when you were kind of complaining about Facebook, and you mentioned that yeah. in your podcast, you, I haven't heard it, you might talk about some of these things in it. Yeah. But it seems like now, that there are such large companies uh, in the tech space that there's just just so easy for them to see an idea that's not that hard to replicate. And even if you, it's an original idea that a startup has, uh, copy it and destroy them pretty quickly. I mean, uh, you were mentioning, you know, your company is, is a large one that has a lot of uh, money. Even Foursquare gets things copied off. Like even Snap, which had an IPO, like. To me, like the Instagram story, or like the story you have a messenger, very obviously copied from Snapchat, but people like still look at, still use it. So it just seems like if you're someone who has a small company or an idea, how do you deal with that? If you're the little guy and all the big guys are just gonna copy, how do you survive in that environment? I guess first I would point out that this is definitely nothing new. Like if you go 100 years ago, even more, you have you know, you see a lot of people complaining, you know, so-and-so copied. I think that there are kind of two things that you have to look at. One is to find sort of a, a business model or an idea that's defensible. So an idea that can be copied very quick. Well, sometimes you want your idea. It, it, the problem isn't that you have your ideas being copied. The problem is more if, you know, it's affecting what you're main business is. And so you want to be part of the kind of marketplace of ideas where everyone's kind of copying back and forth, but you don't want your main thing, you know, to be replicable. So for example, in Foursquare, with our business model, it's our pilgrim technology where, you know, we have this SDK where we can tell, we can take the data from your phone, like your lat long and all that, and say, this person was at this coffee shop and we stopped there. And being able to tag that information. Now maybe Facebook and Google can do that too, but you know, not everyone wants to work with Facebook. A second thing to keep in mind, even if these companies can copy you, oftentimes they won't um, because you know they're so big that they might have a small team trying to copy you, but it won't be the focus of the company. The higher ups are gonna say, hey, we need these guys for something else. And so if you're small and you're really focused on a particular problem, uh, what we see is oftentimes you can win, but not always. So sometimes you have to try to, it, it, it's very hard to figure out which ones you're gonna win and which ones you're not, which is why, and I think that's, so it gets back to Dennis' quote, which he says, just go with it and see what happens and then start thinking about all these issues as you go. Yes. Yeah, um, a lot of tech companies, you know, presumably you said for also that are going towards like, narrow AI or machine learning. Are there any other alternatives that can approach that can do like something similar? Alternatives to narrow AI and machine learning that could do something similar. You mean like solve a similar problem? I mean, it depends what the, it depends what the business is like. Sometimes machine learning and NLP are not the best solution to any given problem. If you want to define it, right? Machine learning, or particularly supervised learning, is just the art of trying to learn function from training data. And anything that you do to solve a problem like that, I guess, would go under the umbrella of machine learning. 
So almost by definition, all that stuff is machine learning. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just want you don't want to use uh, training data. Sometimes you just want to use heuristics, and maybe that's the best problem. Sometimes you want to use just expert analysis, and that's the best way to do it. But I feel like in most cases, uh, the data is going to tell you things that the human experts can't. Looking for ways that machine learning solutions can improve things, make things more efficient, you find a lot of big wins there. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Thanks yeah. a lot. I'll, I'll talk to anyone else later. I'll be here. I'm staying overnight, so I'll be here into tomorrow. So if anyone wants to chat, uh, let me know. All right. Thanks a lot.